Hello, everyone. Easter season greetings. Welcome to this Archdiocesan gathering titled Towards Pentecost Leadership in Times of COVID 19. Hacia Pentecostés, Liderazgos en Tiempo de COVID 19. Our goal in this meeting is to accompany you, parish leaders and ministers, to strengthen our local church and to provide guidance on our current ministerial practices in the midst of this horrific pandemic. My name is Peter Dubtram, I'm the Director of the Institute for Lay Ecclesial Ministry and Service in the Archdiocese of San Antonio, and I give you the warm welcome. And before we begin our meeting, as I always do, I would like to provide a couple of um, logistic items. Everyone, as you can see, you are muted today, but you can ask questions or comments by raising your virtual hand by clicking on the icon label participants right there at the bottom of your window on the right side of your screen. Click the button labeled raise hand and please unmute yourself. And when speaking, state your name and your parish so we can know who you are. Um, and throughout the meeting, if you would like to submit your questions or comments in writing, you can always use the chat section by clicking on the icon labeled chat located in the lower right side on your screen. We will address your questions as much as possible. And finally, this meeting is being recorded and it will be available at a later time. Today, we remember, uh, uh, we remember St. Mary, St. Catherine of Siena. Um, she herself was born in the midst of the pandemic in Italy. Uh, in her letters, she wrote in the year 1300, in a remarkable way, she wrote about the power of God's love on the cross. A transforming power, she says, that permeates every aspect of life. So let's begin with prayer. And I want you to pray with me um, an adaptation of the letter 165 from St. Catherine of Siena. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of life, gentleness and never-ending joy, abide in us so we might encounter through your cross joy. May we live in charity as servants of the servants of Jesus Christ. May we live in your love so that every bitterness, sickness, grief, and trouble be made possible through you, so those great weights become light. May we never forget that we are not alone, for we are loved, worthy of being loved. Help us, O oh God, to embrace Jesus on the cross. Set our hearts on fire so we follow you in the truth. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So at this time, I would like to welcome Aaron Castillo. He's the Secretariat Director for Mission, Life, Justice, Peace, Outreach, and Young Adults. Aaron will share a brief reflection on the power of the cross. Aaron, welcome. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, Juan Carlos, I'm going to share the screen. I, uh, am I able to do that right now? Yes, you are. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, so just as all of you, we have been questioning ourselves here at the Department of Pastoral Ministries, how can we... Um, discern what is it that God wants from us in these times of, of suffering and challenge that we're all facing. And that led us to a reflection on the need to uh, talk a little bit more about the power of the cross, especially now that we're celebrating the resurrection of our Lord. So um, I just want to share with you a few ideas that have been useful to me, and I hope that might be useful either to you or to the people you minister to. So, um, I mean, there's no way around it. We are experiencing a time of loss, of suffering, of great uncertainty and anxiety. And this is all aggravated by the social distancing that we're in. We, we don't have uh, some of the, of the ways in which we usually deal with this stuff. No, I mean, we're not able to go and meet with friends, go and meet with family, go and... Um, get in our knees in front of the tabernacle to pray to our Lord and ask for his help. And nevertheless, we know that the Lord is present in our lives, that he's very much present in our homes. 
and that he cares for everything that we are experiencing. And with these ideas in mind, I have been particularly attentive to everything that I have come across in the, in the past few weeks uh, on, 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 the on the topic of the cross and how the cross can be lived in these times of, of COVID-19. Here are a couple of articles that came out uh, pretty early in the, in the process in March and that I recommend, um, at least they were useful to me. The first one is titled Christians and the Coronavirus Prepared to Lose, and it was published on the, our Sunday Visitor website. And the second one was recommended to me by one of my colleagues here at the department, and it's titled Spirituality for a Time of Scarcity. And uh, it was published by the National Catholic Reporter. So those might be useful to you, but what I found much more useful in this time was this homily by Father Cantalamesa. Father Cantalamesa, as you know, is the preacher of the pontifical household. And as he usually does, he, he preached on, on Good Friday. And his homily, it's worth reading and reflecting upon. It's worth praying upon because it's absolutely beautiful. And I wanted to share with you a couple of, of quotations from, from that text in the hope that it will help us all uh, be more aware of the power of, of, of the cross and, and what uh, God is, is experiencing with us right now as, as we go through all the suffering. Father Cantalamesa says, the cross of Christ has changed the meaning of pain and human suffering, of every kind of suffering, physical and moral. It is no longer punishment, a curse. It was redeemed and its root when the Son of God took it upon himself. What is the surest proof that the drink someone offers you is not poison? And I found this, this metaphor about pain and, and and poison and um, how to understand that what you're being offered is not a poison, uh, particularly beautiful and useful, he answers in the following way. He says, it is that the person drinks, that drinks from the same cup before you do. This is what God has done. On the cross, he drank in front of the whole world, the cup of pain down to its dregs. It is how he showed us it is not poisoned but that there is a pearl at the bottom of this chalice. And uh, finding that pearl might not be easy right now. Uh, it's going to take time and reflection and meditation and prayer and, and lots of conversations with our friends and spiritual guides. And, but at the end, we know, because Christ has gone through this same suffering, that that, that pearl is there. And all of this uh, made me think of, of this... Um, of this woman, uh, uh, Blessed Conchita Cabrera de Armida, we're just about to celebrate the first uh, anniversary of her arrival uh, to the altars. She, she was declared blessed last year uh, at the Basilica of Guadalupe. And she's the founder of, she's one of the founders of the religious order that our Archbishop belongs to, the Missionaries of the Holy Spirit. And when I was, when I was young, I attended a church that uh, was under the care of the missionaries for many, many years. Uh, and it was there that I came across this image of the cross that was revealed to her by our Lord and that has uh, a lot of meaning. And every single item within the cross uh, means something, the, the, the dove, of course, the Holy Spirit, but that little cross that's on top of the, of the heart and then the heart and the light, every single element means a lot of things. But I just wanted to finish this reflection um, reading with, uh, one of the explanations that you can find in the internet about what the, what the big cross means, and it reads as follows. It says, it is a symbol of our human condition that Christ wished to make his. It also signifies that our daily cross, united to Christ's, participates in the redemptive value and allows us to reach intimacy with him. So as we go through all this suffering and the people that we minister to go through all this suffering, it's very good to, to keep this in mind. You know, the, the Lord uh, has transformed pain. He has made it his own, and therefore it has transformed it into the... Thank you, Rob. I, I think we lost connection in the last thought that you were sharing. Could you share sure, with course. us again? Just a couple uh, of minutes, we lost you. Okay, so... Um, 
did you hear what I said about Conchita? Yes. Okay, so the, the last thing I said was, I was talking about all the symbolism that it's uh, included in, in, this, in this image of the cross. And I was just sharing the meaning of that, of, of the large cross within that uh, combination of elements. It says, the large cross is the symbol of our human condition that Christ wished to make his. It also signifies that our daily cross united to Christ participates in its redemptive value and allows us to reach intimacy with him. So my last thoughts were that as we, as we journey through these times of uncertainty and, and loss, it's good to keep in mind that the, the cross is there as an opportunity for us to participate in Christ's redemptive mission, as well as an opportunity for us to reach larger intimacy with him. Thank you so much, Aaron. Thank you. Um, thank you for that profound reflection, too. Um, with that, I would like to welcome uh, Gigi Sipian. She's the Secretariat Director for Evangelization, Catechesis, and Faith Formation. Gigi will provide a quick preview of the Archbishop's updates. Um, welcome, Gigi. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, some of you may be aware, some not, uh, that at this time, there are no changes to Archbishop's decree of April 16th, which, as we know, is in place until May 18th. In the coming days, the Archbishop will be consulting with the Presbyteral Council, as well as health and civic officials before making any substantive, substantive changes to current policies and procedures for parishes. Now, that being said, there is one new option that parishes have within these guidelines. At the pastor's discretion, First Communion celebrations may take place while always respecting, of course, the 10 person limit in the churches and the necessary social distancing. You also may be aware that the, all the bishops of the United States and Canada will be consecrating their respective countries, US and Canada, to the Blessed Virgin Mary, I should say, re-consecrating them. And that is going to take place on Friday, May 1st. Uh, this is something that we can participate in at 2 p.m. Central Time. The easiest way is to go to usccb.org and click on the link, which will take you to another page where you can go to the USCCB Facebook page or Instagram or Twitter account. And also from the USCCB website, you can even download a copy of the uh, worship aid, either in English or in Spanish. So you, you may want to participate in this and, uh, and tell others about it. All the information is there on the site. And that's really it for the updates, Peter. Thank you so much, Gigi. Um, and um, with that, let's welcome uh, Lisette Faria. Ms. Lisette Faria, she's the Secretariat Director for Christian Community, Laity, Marriage, Family Life, and Youth. Lisette, you have a couple of questions for our leaders. Welcome. Yes, hello. Um, yeah, I just want to continue the conversation and really open uh, this time for us to share. Um, and um, it's going to be focused on leadership uh, in our ministry during this time of, of, of pandemic. Uh, most of the, uh, all of us are pastoral leaders and are facing challenges. So um, the question, uh, I am posting the questions on the chat, uh, is what challenges have you encountered uh, during this time of pandemic in the context of pastoral ministry? I know Aaron was talking about, you know, the cross the cross of uh, God and our own daily crosses. So please feel free to share that. What challenges have you encountered in the context of pastoral ministry? 
And then how have you overcome them? And, and what blessings have you seen arise from uh, this reality uh, of doing pastoral ministry in, in a different setting as we are doing it right now? So the floor is open. I think you will, we ask you that you raise your virtual hand and then, uh, and then you can share your, um, your comment to any of that uh, uh, section of the sharing. So please feel free to share. Peter, this is Rick Olivares. I'm on a cell phone and I don't know where my virtual hand is. You're, you're fine, Rick, go ahead. So consequently, uh, Lizette was saying, uh, what challenges uh, have we faced as pastoral leaders? Well, obviously, the obvious ones are exactly, you know, the inability to gather the group, you know, considering that uh, as, as catechetical leaders, as pastoral leaders, you know, one of our main objectives is to bring people together. Um, so obviously, we are all doing uh, uh, programs like Zoom or Facebook. Uh, as a way to still stay connected. As I tell my students, it at least gives us an opportunity to see each other's eyes, you know, uh, and, and to uh, make that connection because that is what we are all about. Um, and overcoming it uh, beyond the, the, that, that connection uh, that we're using uh, the media for, um, it's also that whole idea that uh, many, of, uh, for instance, many of my students don't want to communicate on Zoom. It's that whole camera shy you know, situation. So um, trying to help them to overcome that, I think, has become an, uh, an, an interesting challenge. You know, it's hard enough to get them to overcome uh, uh, discussing things in person, let alone now that they're being, you know, uh, uh, they're on a camera, they're being recorded, so to speak. Um, so, you know, that has been interesting. So the blessing, I think, that's come with that is that students have actually started to overcome that. It has been very nice to hear from them finally after one or two or three meetings they they're they're feeling comfortable enough to communicate their thoughts and their ideas uh, uh in such a way that uh they have the floor there is absolutely no no other way to explain the fact that they're they are the center of that particular attention once that little green square pops up around their 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 picture or their video uh so those are just you know some basic ideas that i think we've been going through um not to mention the fact um the challenge of working with all the different populations that are currently not at uh, the parish. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Rick. Like said, we have um, another Velma Sproul. She wants to, to share. Go ahead, Velma, if you can unmute yourself. Thank you. I don't know if Velma maybe lost connection. If in the meantime, we have somebody else. Yes, we have um, on the chat, it says, uh, Teresa says that uh, the biggest challenge has been being able to get in touch with parents who don't read bulletin um, and, you know, and keep up with the changes, especially with um, um, email and so forth. Um, and um, um, Joan is also sharing resources and says and suggests to um, follow up Bishop Mike. He has a special prayers this Friday, Friday regarding the consecration that Gigi mentioned. So mm -hmm. it would be good if you are on social media, if you want to follow Bishop Mike for that. Um, hi. Oh, hi. Hi, this is Sylvia from St. Dominic's. Oh, yes. Hi, Sylvia. How are you? Um, one of our, our, our challenges um, has been that now as, as things, uh, you know, with that announcement from the governor and everything, one of the things that I found out, especially our young adults, they are so eager to, to, to somehow get a close, you know, be close together and pray together and, and talk about things that they, the first thing they ask, well, would this be open for us to meet in like a parking lot with separate distances? And talk about experiences and and that's something that is a challenge for me because the first thing that I'm trying as a leader is, is to keep them safe to keep us all safe but at the same time I, I can see how the level of anxiety is is get increasing as the week goes by 
So the way that we do it is we we go through Skype or, or we say, I send them uh, daily reflections, daily reflections, constant, constant uh, communication with the parents. We use the remind me. And, and one of the things that helps us is because besides letting them know when we have a Google class, the, uh, I, I can share with them different meditations, reflections, or ways to how they can communicate with the family, so the youth, how they can, you know, activities for both of them. When mm -hmm. it challenges them to do a lot of activities together, as far as the youth ministry side. Mm -hmm. and adults, well, I, I, we are, I'm trying to think of uh, different ways to, to help them to ease that anxiety and to know that we are all here together and we're here for each other. Little things as a birthday reminders is one of the things with the high school right now, the challenge is all the graduation that has had their, the, they, they, they kind of said about it. So we're trying to find different ways when they can know that their community is with them. So trying to blow up pictures so we can do something about it. It's, it's just finding different things. So that's a challenge. Yeah. And, I, yeah, and, you, and speaking of that tension, right, how do you balance that and how do you, as leaders, become really mediators of, of all of that? Yes. Uh, one of the things that I try to do every day is, you know, to con connect to the mass, the streaming mass that we have in our parish, as well as the rosary. We are doing different things as far as rosary, including all families and the youth. Mm -hmm. um, and then myself, I have to find time to meditate, to pray, to reflect, because I, I believe, and to find different ways of, um, how do you call it? To learn more about different ways and how to cope with these anxieties and what is the best way to help them. There are so many resources, but because I believe that right now, especially in, in these next two coming weeks, we need to pray, we need to find our peace, we need mm -hmm. to remember that we are going to be the ones that are going to be facing them. So we need to build ourselves, our spirituality. That's what we need to feed. Feed our spirituality so we are given to them, be able to give anything to them. Continue to grow in all aspects. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you. Peter, do we have time for uh, one more? Or was Velma able to share? We have a, yes, uh, one more minute for somebody else if okay. you want to share. Last comment for, from someone. More minutes at the end, um, but thank you, Lisette, and thank you for posing these very important questions. Um, now, I would like to welcome Father Eliodoro Lucatero. Uh, Father Elio, he is the secretary director for Lead to G and Christian Prayer. Father El El Lucatero, welcome. Thank you. Um, thank you, Peter, and. Um, I'm, I'm glad to um, be able to uh, share a few thoughts uh, with all of you about uh, this uh, time, uh, the, uh, the season that we are living, the, uh, in spite of the circumstances, the joy of the resurrection of the Lord that is leading us into uh, Pentecost. Although it, it may be a rocky road right now with uh, this pandemic, uh, not, not being able to celebrate our liturgies in, um, with, uh, uh, publicly. Uh, and so to having to adapt our liturgies to the circumstances, is, it has been a challenge for everyone, for the people, for the leaders, for, for the uh, uh, celebrants, for the, uh, those who are uh, um, presiding at our liturgies. And uh, so, this year we are, as you know, uh, celebrating uh, Pentecost on May 31st. And uh, so far the Archbishop has uh, set up a date for the 18th of May. We are not certain still what is really going to happen after May 18, if this is going to be extended or is it going to be limited still to more than uh, 10 people, perhaps again back to 50. We don't know. We are waiting for the Archbishop to, to give us guidance on that. So in the meantime, how do we prepare for, for a liturgy that we are not certain how is it going to be um, 
how are we going to be able to celebrate it? So given uh, that those circumstances, one of the things that I, that I will suggest that you and your parishes and, and your um, ministers, that you prepare. You prepare for uh, whichever way we may go. If, if we are going to be able to have a full, um, a full church and multiple celebrations at a parish, uh, then this will be a wonderful, perhaps a wonderful opportunity uh, to um, to celebrate Pentecost as a new. Well, we have um, start uh, celebrated during the uh, Easter season the new rebirth, but again, this will be a also an opportunity for a more symbolic way to for the birth of the church by the gift of the holy spirit so it will be interesting to have that kind of celebration if it is limited you still are able to to celebrate in in all its um, its uh, liturgical elements uh, the um, the celebration whether it is the uh, the the visual or whether it will be the day of pentecost so in if by any reason we have to still be limited to 10 people still the celebration can go on if it is virtual but i think it will be wonderful to have certain elements that will um that will emphasize that will uh, overline or highlight uh, the elements of this gift of the Holy Spirit uh, at Pentecost uh, as, a, as a way for us to continue on and that nothing will stop us whatsoever from having that uh, joy of the celebration of the gift of the Holy Spirit to the church. Thank you so much, Father. It's uh, uh, indeed, I think it's an opportunity for our local church to celebrate in a new way. I wonder if anyone that is joining us today, if we have initial thoughts on, on how we can, you know, dream big, as you said, Father, but at the same time with this uncertainty of not knowing if we are going to be able to ce celebrate with 10, 50 or, or 100. I don't know, initial thoughts, uh, feedback, um, questions from attendees. The mic is open. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? This is Elsa. Yes, welcome. Hi. Um, one thing that I've been kind of looking at, uh, I live across the street from a church. It's, a, I think, a Baptist church. And um, I noticed that they've been having those drive-in uh, services. And so all morning on Sunday, they have uh, the pastor out there with a microphone. Uh, he reads the liturgy. He does, you know, the, he reads the, the gospel. And then he preaches. They have their worship teams set up, like, in their back parking lot. And um, they manage to keep distance by staying in their car, the people that come to attend the service. And I'll be across the street hearing honking all morning <laughs> because they're honking as the pastor is, you know, giving them their nourishment of the word, how they receive. And so um, I was thinking like, maybe not necessarily a drive-in, but at some of the parishes I've seen where some like schools or other places are doing like a parade. And so I don't know if like some kind of a celebration where we do we don't spend time with each other, but drive by at our local parishes and maybe have that as a, a symbol of, of how we still continue to, you know, share that time together and celebrate our Lord and what he has done and how the Holy Spirit will come. So th that's something that I've kind of, you know, thought about based on what I've witnessed from our church across the street, the Baptist church here. So I don't know what people what the church, you know, what the decree involves as far as not allowing or maybe allowing something like that, but that's a consideration perhaps. Thank you, Elsa. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Keeping the community united, celebrating together. Thank you. Um, any, any other feedback, question, comments? 
how can we dream big as we approach the Feast of Pentecost? Joan says in the in the chat that we are we will be happy to provide the archdiocese with a virtual novena in anticipation of, Pente of Pentecost. So that's coming up by all means. Well, thank you, Father. You are going to stay with us. So if we have all the questions, we'll be able to ask you, right? Thank you. Thank you. And and now then I would like to welcome back Aron Castillo. Aron, you also have a very important question and comment to share with us. Welcome back. Thank you very much, Peter. Just as Lisette did, I'm posting a question right now in the chat. It reads, what are the plans that your parish or ministry has to continue supporting our parishioners' basic needs? How can the Archdiocese assist you in, in those efforts? And um, to put a context to this, I, I was recently reading an article titled, What Do Christians Do in a Plague? And uh, the, the, the short answer to that is they pray and they serve. They serve uh, those who are most in need. And um, yesterday evening, I, I hosted a meeting with young adult ministries, ministry leaders. And uh, one of the things that they shared in the space, just like the one that we have right now, was uh, the efforts that a certain parish is doing to keep its food pantry open um, and, and, and everything that comes with it. Because in order to be able to provide food to those that need, uh, those who need it, uh, others have to donate that food and therefore it requires logistics and a, and a large effort that is precisely the kind of thing that we have to do right now. So um, we would like to, to allow some, uh, a few minutes for you to share with us either things that are happening in your parish or ideas that you might have and you want to share with, uh, with, with the rest of those who are here in the, in, in the meeting about how do we serve at this time of need. Hello, <laughs> this is Celia again from St. Dominic's. Um, in our parish, uh, they have St. Vincent de Paul. And however, there is a, a group of ladies that will be reading my ministry who asking by asking donations amongst of the community. They uh, prepare plates, meals uh, for different families that are in need right now. And another group, it's like a team effort. Another team uh, bakes the cookies, a separate team Bake the put them in bags. A separate team puts together all the meals, and I and another couple of ladies they go and they deliver them with the with the precautions needed, of course. Uh, that's one of the things that they are doing. Another thing is that the same beautiful ladies they are somebody that takes care of donations of material, elastic, and then the the um, the other there is a couple or more that sews all the masks. So they have been delivering masks to the hospitals, to the first responders, and to anybody that uh, lets the office know that they, they are in need of masks. So this is a continued work. It's everyday, everyday work. Uh, and like you said, it takes uh, asking for donations and everything. But that's what they are doing, and they are doing a beautiful job right now. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. Joan is uh, suggesting a question in the in the chat. It says, is your parish staying in touch with those that are most vulnerable, the elderly, families with special needs, children, the newly unemployed? Because th those are all people who, who are in, in need for, for accompaniment and for material support. So um, staying in touch with those families and, and uh, being there for them is very important right now. So also, if anybody has an experience to share in that realm, it will be very useful for the rest of us. Um, I know that at St. Anthony Mary Claret, we have um, the Gable Project, which is geared towards um, women and families who have young children who are um, in need of uh, material assistance. So as a matter of fact, this morning, we just kind of switched out the winter clothes to summer clothes. And every Thursday morning um, until noon, um, women and families were able to come and we provide free diapers and wipes for them. I know it was very scarce there for a little bit, so we could give each family just a little bit so that more families can be provided for. Um, and then in the evening also, we're open um, until 5 p.m. 
So that's something that we're able to provide. Um, and whether they're in our parish or not, we just provide it, um, you know, citywide. And there's a lot of mothers, single parents out there that are really desperate for um, just necessities, you know, whatever that is to make sure that they were able to provide for their children. So um, that's something that we're doing. Um, unfortunately, we had to close our pantry door because um, we were not unable to, um, we ran out of food. Um, and I know, I think last time, I don't know which um, chat or Zoom I was on, but I think that Catholic Charities said that they could bring a truck out to help us. So I know that that's something that we're in the process of trying to do to reopen our pantry door, especially, I'm sorry, I'm from St. Anthony Mary Claret, so we're kind of out in the northwest side of town. Um, but anyways, that's something that I think we need to try to get moving again because we've had to close our pantry door, but a, a Gable Project is still open for, for assistance. So if you know of anybody, anybody in your parishes that are needing diapers and wipes, um, please refer them to Gable Project. Thank you, thank you very much, Marty, for sharing with us. And I'll be happy to to uh, contact the folks from Catholic Charities to let them know about this need. And um, in, in in this week's edition of our newsletter, we included the latest on the different projects that Catholic Charities is offering right now. And and there's lots of useful information there, as well as opportunities for people in the parishes to either donate or volunteer. Uh, and of course, Catholic Charities, it kind of centralizes help that then goes uh, out to the whole community. So it's a good way to, to, to support everyone. Uh, and yet, all these efforts that are being done in individual parishes are so important. Thank you. Thank you so much. So how about, uh, I don't know if now we open up the forum for your questions, your comments, so we can continue share about what your parishes are doing to reach out to those who have um, the, the, have the needs. Um, but let's open the forum then for your question. If you have any other question to Father Lucatero, to Gigi, to Lisette, this is our time. Yes, can you hear me? This is Yolanda. Welcome. And I would like to share with you, um, and just going back to Aron's question about how do we serve? And I have discovered at, uh, that it's, at this point for me, it's been more about doing versus being. And what I mean by that is uh, exercising the ministry of compassionate listening. And I've discovered that that's one of the areas in which I have um, some of the people that I work with within the different parishes that simply reach out uh, for that sole purpose is just to uh, share and just to have someone listen. And I think that in, in um, and totally understandable, in this that we feel very incompetent of how, what do we do, what do we do, that we may bypass that that's one of the most important is to be able to be there and just listen to one another. And so that's just, um, what I uh, wanted to share and my take on it. Thank you. Thank you, Yolanda. So my name's Sue Torres and I work at St. Joseph Honey Creek in Spring Branch. Um, and to kind of piggyback onto Yolanda's comment, um, we have a rather strong new evangelization team. And so when COVID kind of was um, causing a lot of concern and question. They were very quick to um, act, gathering um, a list of um, volunteers that were willing to make phone calls to a vast majority of our parishioners. Um, and I think, you know, just to hear the concern, the genuine interest um, that their parish was there for them was so comforting for many. Um, and in the process, they developed a script and, you know, prayed together with um, the person on the other end of the phone, um, asked if they had any special needs, whether it be spiritual, food, uh, monetary, and they gathered a list um, and reported that back to our pastor and some other um, staff members. Um, and I think it was very well received. Uh, again, you know, just being able to, to have a human contact. Um, and then from our 
point of view as staff, it was really good to kind of even update our database um, with proper phone numbers, email addresses, and things of that nature too. So um, that was that was just one thing that we found to be beneficial. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sue. Thank you. We still have time for a couple of more. Hello. Welcome. My name is Frank Pellina. I'm from the Lady of Guadalupe Parish. I'm a, a deacon that just transferred from New Hampshire in October. And uh, I, I, people can see my knee. I can't figure out where my camera is so I can show you my lovely face. Anyway, I think one of the things that I've experienced um, is the resilience of our parishioners um, in doing a lot of things for themselves and for one another. Um, we have a monthly rosary uh, on Saturday mornings in one of the parishioners' houses, and obviously we can't do that at this time. And so they've gotten Zoom meetings going, and you see some of the uh, less proficient and older parishioners learning a new technology to be able to express a wonderful tradition of rosaries together. Um, we have some of our uh, homebound ministers who can't go to see the eld elderly, um, making calls, making regular contact with them, uh, and then sharing that information with the rest of the team. Uh, our axemen uh, have been sending out emails. Um, I think one of the things we're doing out, out here at Sanctus Ranch is the Divine Mercy Chaplet at three o'clock every day and broadcasting it, streaming it from a uh, Facebook page. So those are some of the things we've tried to do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deacon. Thank you. Beautiful, beautiful sharing, beautiful images of the Easter people, being Easter people, being able to be there, attentive to the people at the margin. These are beautiful, beautiful stories. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. One more. Well, we have uh, Teresa shares in the chat that, um, well, she said first, thank you for the helpful hints uh, you have gave us uh, at the last virtual meeting. And she says that she's now having the special needs class and regular classes and a picture to our parish of the sacred place they have created. Um, and Tammy continues saying that one thing that they do is keep younger children engaged and she reads the storybook live on Facebook. Beautiful. Every Tuesday at 6 p.m. Beautiful. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the presence of the church actively um, being there for those who are in need of that connection, of that compassionate li listening, as you, Yolanda, were mentioning. Beautifully. Beautiful. Well, uh, once again, thanks, thanks, thanks to everyone for joining us today. Um, but let's, before we, be, we finish, let, let me acknowledge and thank our secretariat directors, Lisette, Aaron, Gigi, Father Lucatero, and also Juan Carlos Rodriguez. Uh, he is the guy the, who does amazing things in the background to make this meeting <laughs> as smoothly as possible. Thank you, Juan Carlos. So to finish our meeting today, I would like to, to, um, to invite Gigi to lead us in a closing prayer for everyone that has been affected by this horrific pandemic. Gigi, um, lead us in prayer. This is the prayer that Archbishop has asked us to pray together during this period of time. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Lady of Guadalupe, in these times of tribulation, we turn to you, O Mother. See with compassion the suffering of your beloved sons and daughters affected by the coronavirus pandemic. 
throughout the entire world. Ask your son to have mercy on us, bringing healing to those infected and protection to all your children. Jesus Christ, Savior of all people, grant us courage to accompany and care for the entire world in the wake of sorrow and uncertainty. We seek refuge in you, and according to your promise, deliver us from this danger. Amen. St. Anthony of Padua, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And dear friends, it's ministry. We are here for you, and we are very moved by the fact they are there for so many people. But if you need our information, it will be displayed on the screen. You can always visit the website of the Archdiocese under there. You will see the Department for Pastoral Ministry. So feel free to contact us because we know that united as one people of God, we go for it. And I am Peter Dutram, and I thank you. And until next time, thank you so much. Have a blessed week.